Hey folks, welcome back to Only the Best Fantasy Novels. And today I want to talk about the Green Angel Tower. The absolutely humongous sprawling ending of the Memory, Sorrow and Thorn trilogy. Um, if you've been living under a rock and you haven't heard of this series as yet, this is one of Classic Fantasy's most beloved series. And honestly, reading the first two books, they were good, but I didn't quite get the hype. This is the book that delivers. This is the one that, that really allowed me to understand why this series is so beloved by both readers who have a lot of nostalgia for the series as it came out and also new readers who try it. And even me, who's read far too many fantasy series at this point. Um, but Tad, in this book, Tad takes his time. He, he, he uses all the space he wants. And he proves to us that if we thought the first two books were cinder blocks, that wasn't even his final form. <sighs> also, he proved that he could Sanderson before Sanderson Sanderson. Um, if you've read this book and you're familiar with the ending, you know exactly what aspect of the ending I'm talking about. Um, yeah, so <laughs> if you thought um, the Dragon Ball Cheer and Stone of Farewell were slow, bloated, and can use editing. Uh, Tad showed he could he could take this to an extreme. Like th this book, this book is massive, and in most editions it was split into two parts. Normally, if I see something split into multiple parts, I would say that's a cash grab. In this case, I don't think it was physically feasible to print this book in any edition. <laughs> Or if the technology of the time even allowed it to be printed, it, it's so chunky. Like th this big bastard is one of the light, one of the longest fantasy novels ever written. But um, yeah, enough enough like intro about this series. What is this book about? So following the events at the end of Stone of Farewell, Josso gathers his army. Elias marches on him, and things are about to come to a head. Um, in the Loki's grasp, Titans on the land, and we start to see manifest we, like we we already saw manifestations of it, but this is the book in, in which it really ratchets up. Um, like nature starts to go out of whack, that kind of thing. And then, of course, there's the quest for the three swords, and um, what exactly these three swords are supposed to do when they come together, we don't know. But um, yeah, they they're supposed to come together. Um, in true epic fantasy style, I should say, and that's basically this book. It's the final confrontation. It's the final confrontation of both the major and minor act villains, I guess you can see. Um, but yeah, like um, I honestly, the editions that I read were like two separate. It, it was the common two parts ones that everyone. Um, everyone talks about the first one being um, I don't even remember the names at this point but I saw somewhere that this was initially one big plan book and then it was just cut in half for publishers and funnily enough it's structured in such a way that that was very easy for publishers to do because the first half of the book which is the first part one I guess you can say it um, it, it, it wraps up the story of Elias versus Joshua their, um, their particular clash and that was a pretty that was, that was satisfying. I think, um, as far as classic fantasy goes, that that was probably one of the most fun battle scenes I've, I've ever like read. Um, it, it was great stuff. I kind of like how Elias's story played out. Um, like that was, they took an interesting direction. Direction. They also took a kind of a nod from. Um, they, they, it took a bit of a nod from Lord of Rings there to me in the way that his story ended. Um, or maybe I'm just reading too much into that particular scenario. Anyway, and then in part two, we have the final confrontation against with everyone against Pirates when the three swords have to come together and um, and we have to deal with the emergence of Inuloki and like the, these aren't spoilers at this point this this is very much a classic fancy going into this given this is you're watching the video of a third book of a series i think you understand at this point and this is the typical trajectory of this um 
of these books. But um, but this is the point where things get interesting because Tad pulls off a pretty decent subversion. When I think back on the classic fantasy that I, that I read around this time, like they're very binary in that you can always tell the bad guys, you can always tell the good guys. The bad guys are always bad, the good guys are always very good. Um, they're, they're, every now and then there may be a little bit of moral ambiguity between them, but not drastically so. Um, but this book, like this book, one thing I loved about it is that the motivations of the bad guys, they're handled very creatively for 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 the time period in which this book was written. Like, um, like you can actually, you understand why they do what they do. Like they're not just evil for the sake of evil because moha. Um, they, they like they, you 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 empathize with them. You understand where they're coming from. You can think on what uh, on the challenges they face because that takes his time and just you get everything so you can you can kind of mull over the situation yourself and kind of think of the choices that face these people and what they do as a result um, so that like I, I I love that aspect of how this wrapped up um, another favorite aspect of this book is just the horror element like uh, one thing I'm like really surprised of with this series is like just how much horror there is in it like when you think on something like the Lord of the Rings and like the classic fantasy that this ser this series is very much a contemporary of, or or a um, or a successor of, you can see like they often contain very dark they, they often contain dark elements as part of like the evil forces, but horror itself isn't necessarily always part of the story. That's not the case with that. Like that very much incorporates horror in it and he doesn't do it in like a um he doesn't do it in a in your face way he doesn't do it it in, in like an obvious way it's it's baked in in the events and in some of the events that in, in both in some of the events that occur and in some of the events that he alludes to and some of the things like he hints at and it's really well done it like Honestly, some of the horror, some of the more horror-oriented parts of this book are my my favorite parts of this series. I I think it gave like what could otherwise be seen as a very um, as a very average series, like a little bit of spice. And I'm not talking about modern day TikTok spice. Um, it, uh, just a bit of seasoning, you know. And um, it it worked well. I think um, I think having now read this entire series, if I had one complaint, it's that Tad spends pages and pages and pages on our main characters, like on the entire cast. Like we know them well, we know them inside out. They they may have started as tropes in book one, but they have become something drastically different by the by the third book. Unfortunately, the 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 main characters on the antagonist side they don't get that same treatment. Like um, in the Loki, by the end, he still just felt like this big bad evil. Um, he never really, like, he he just felt like your standard big bad evil. He was here, he was there. He needed to be defeated. He might or might not have been defeated. Read and find out. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much all there is to in the Loki. Um, and then there's Pirates, who is pretty much Saruman 1.1. I can't even call him Saruman 2.0. He never really ascends beyond that um, evil archmage archetype, and um, it's kind of it kind of sucks because given Tad's the, the way that Tad is just skillful at baking horror into the story, I feel like if we'd gotten a little bit more time with Pirates. There could have been some pretty creative things done with him, but um, it is what it is. Like this is the story we've gotten, and it's just unfortunate for him. Um, like even in Norn Queen, we we got a little bit of time with her, but not um, not too much. So she isn't fleshed out as well as a result. And it's by the end of this series, you like you kind of feel like an imbalance because of it. Um, but then again, this is classic fantasy. Like we don't exactly see too much of the bad guys unless like they're in conflict with the 
main characters and given the way that these books are written there is not that much direct confrontation when you think about it but um yeah like that that i think that's my one core complaint to the series overall it was it was certainly worth the ride um i can see like i said i can see why it's so beloved and i'm actually amazed that like something like this came out it, this would have come out in like the early 90s right around the time when like game of thrones and um and a song of Game of Thrones and Wheel of Time and so would have just been starting up, and um, I can see why why it's why it's so beloved, pretty much. Um, all in all, a book with a absolutely ridiculous page count, a, a series I should say with an absolutely ridiculous page count. Quite a lot of been of it being stripped out. Sure, would it have been the same story? Honestly, I'm not sure. Um, it is what it is, it exists as it is, and I enjoyed what I read. Um, that's all I can say about it, really and truly. If you're a fan of like classic fantasy, check this out. It like there's a reason why I having read it now I can say that I can see why it's considered like one of the best of the genre. Um, how well it holds up to modern fantasy, it depends it truly depends on the taste of the reader. Like this is very much this is very much classic fancy at the end of the day. Um, if your taste run to more modern fancy, it may not work for you. But if you like, if, if you have a lot of nostalgia for the time period in which these books would have come out, I can absolutely see you having a blast with this. And um, yeah, that's my thoughts on the on the Green Angel Tower, the final book in the Memory Sorrow and Thorn trilogy. If you've made it this far into the video, thank you very much for watching and I'll see you next time.